Hi, everyone. I'm honored to be asked to speak today on civil commitment, a harm mitigation approach. And I'm also excited to listen and learn to other speakers here at the conference who are a wealth of information. My name is Janet Hayes, and my organization is Healing Minds NOLA. And despite my bio, I imagine some of you are probably wondering who I am and why I care about equity and justice for people living with serious mental illnesses. And I am going to apologize in advance for reading at times. I'm a serial digressor. And if I don't keep my uh, dissertation uh, to a half hour on paper, I tend to ramble and go over. So um, with that, uh, so here's, here's why I do what I do. The inhumanity of excluding people with living with serious mental illnesses from systems of care, it hits home hard for me. In New Orleans, after Hurricane Katrina, we went through a complete system shutdown after the levees broke. Uh, hospital beds were precious in our ghost town that had been thriving before the disaster. And as the city drained and people slowly crept back, those with serious brain disorders wandered the streets, ostracized and discriminated against by what was left of our mental health system and a society that has determined they have no value. So my advocacy began in really in January of 2009, I got a call from someone who let me know that my friend Kane had died on the 10th floor of the House of Detention, the now replaced decrepit Orleans Parish Jail after five hours and five point restraints. She suffered from asthma and was having an asthma attack when she was placed on her back, which was really the cause of death. But she also suffered from panic attacks and serious chronic depression. That she sought help at a private hospital that had her arrested when she became combative after being given a medication that made her aggressive. And the sheriff said she was trying to kill herself. So that's how she ended up in five point restraints. That day, I switched from being a footloose and fancy free audio engineer, recording engineer from Canada to fighting for justice for a community that had become my family. A community rich in culture, history and charm, and unfortunately, poverty and crime. Kane and thousands of people like her were shut out of care in 2005 after Hurricane Katrina due to the intentional closure of Charity Hospital, our largest and oldest public hospital in the state that cared for the indigent. And there were actually 10 of them statewide. The hospital had 128 inpatient psychiatric beds and 50 crisis stabilization beds. And to this day, those beds have never been fully replaced. Having gone from approximately 200 psychiatric beds to zero overnight, we saw a huge uptick in people with serious mental illnesses being funneled into the criminal justice system and encampments under a downtown overpass. Locals just say under the bridge. As I got more involved with the issue, I learned that Kane was one casualty of many. A New Orleans police officer and her eight week old unborn child was killed with her own, by her, with her own service weapon by a treatment non-adherent man who had been cycling in and out of psychiatric hospitals for years. After that, we got our assisted outpatient treatment law, Nicola's law. Seen as an unfunded mandate, it sat on the books unused for 10 years and tragedies continue to happen. And I'll talk more about assisted outpatient treatment as I move on. The hospital sat vacant for years. In 2015, our governor at the time, Governor Jindal, put out a request social worker, I'm a case manager. And in this case, I decided I've got to be a developer um, if, I, if I'm going to be successful in getting uh, the state to do what I thought needed to be done with the hospital. So I put, uh, so I sent in a proposal to adaptively reuse the million square foot building as a one-stop shop, mental health care and research center of excellence. It would have provided needed auxiliary psychiatric beds, crisis stabilization beds, transitional residential treatment beds, outpatient programs, and services, vocational training, research, and so much more. I needed to submit the proposal under the name of an organization. So to make a long story short, that's how my nonprofit was born. Healing Minds NOLA works to remove barriers to treatment and care, specifically for people suffering with untreated and undertreated serious mental illnesses who otherwise end up incarcerated, homeless, and dead. HB 335 is the psychiatric deterioration bill we introduced this, this session, this year, 2022, that includes an, ex, a, an expanded standard 
was considered gravely disabled. So before its passage, the law required an individual needing treatment and care for a psychiatric illness to be either dangerous to self, dangerous to others, or gravely disabled. If we are to accept that serious mental illnesses are like any other illnesses, why do we hold treatment for serious mental illnesses to such a high bar? Imagine trying to help a loved one, loved one with cancer to get treatment only to be denied on the basis that they are not dangerous or sick enough. Imagine waking up one morning feeling like, like a 200 pound person was sitting on your chest only to be told by the ER that unless you're feeling suicidal, there is no help for you. Is it any wonder then that so many people with serious mental illnesses end up in the criminal justice system and or homeless? What is just about laws that require people to be dangerous? Legal barriers that force people who suffer with no fault neurobiological dis disorders into jails and prisons is not humane. Families I work with on a daily basis and whose loved ones are afflicted with mental illnesses are best positioned to recognize and identify these early signs of deterioration leading to dangerousness and get their loved ones to the help they desperately need. Yet when they call for help, they're asked, are you feeling threatened? Are they dangerous? So approximately half of people with schizophrenia and 40% of people with bipolar disease have anosognosia. That is the inability to conate that they suffer from a mental illness, similar to how a dementia patient may be unable to conate that they suffer from dementia. For this reason, they will not voluntarily seek help. Family members, friends, and community become their only lifeline, yet they are handcuffed to help. And I just will say about lack of insight, anosognosia, it's not denial. Denial is when you know you have an illness, but you don't want to admit it, you don't want to talk about it, but you're aware that you're sick. Anosognosia is entirely different. It's, it's almost like a, uh, it's a corollary or a symptom of the disease itself. The, it's an unfortunate irony that the part of the brain that's needed to know you're sick is the same part of the brain that the illness impacts that prevent you from knowing that you're sick. And so unless there's help, you know, uh, treatment, uh, often in the often psychotropic medications can help and they do help to restore insight, the person never, never gets better. Uh, the result is deadly. Delays in treatment can lead to increased morbidity and, and mortality, including the development of other various psych psychiatric and physical comorbidities and the adoption of life-threatening and life-altering self-treatments like, for example, licit and illicit substance abuse. Evidence suggests that early intervention and treatment leads to better chance for recovery. Changing the standard does not create more people needing care. It simply provides for treatment and care earlier upstream for people who are already sick. At least 24 states have incorporated, and there may be more now, have incorporated a more modern psychiatric deterioration standard to assist people during times when they cannot care for their own safety and care and well being. Too many people are living untreated due to high barriers to entry to psychiatric hospitals and low barriers to release. I'll never forget my friend Eleanor Chapman recounting to me the, the deaths of her grandchildren after her daughter took their lives, lives as a result of untreated psychosis. Speaking to the mental health system who failed her and her daughter, she said, is she dangerous enough for you yet? After five years in jail, her, her daughter finally got the treatment. Sorry, I have to give, I tear up every time I think about this story. It's so tragic, but it did have a happy ending. Her daughter finally got the treatment and care she needed at the forensic hospital in Jackson, Louisiana, but that will not bring her children back. And one has to ask how much suffering is enough it's hard for me to talk about some of these things. This is so real for so many people. I will say up front that legalizing a standard for earlier treatment is not a panacea. It's one thing to be able to get people into hospitals. It's an entirely other thing to be able to get them into treatment. And so as much as I will talk about what the psychiatric deterioration standard change does, I'm also going to talk about what it doesn't do. 
Insurance reimbursement caps, mental health workforce shortages, discrimination, and poor standards of care are ongoing sy systemic problems that better civil commitment laws do not address. However, should we deny a person the right to access treatments for an illness simply because we don't have a system for them to plug into? It's a bit of a chicken and an egg situation, but I feel strongly that systems change when they're forced to change. A different kind of involuntary coercion. I remember fighting for Medicaid expansion, even though the state of Louisiana thought that the system would be flooded if we allowed people greater access. Yet we decided rightly that access to healthcare is a right. And I remember thinking, because I'm from Canada, so we have a single payer system. Uh, everybody has some kind of insurance uh, at no cost to the patient. Nobody wants to go to the doctor. I remember thinking this argument that if we allow access through Medicaid expansion to people to be able to go see a doctor that the system would flood. I was like, nobody's gonna go see a doctor. People don't wanna do that. So anyway, I think we have some irrational beliefs at times about you know, realities that um, simply don't come to fruition. But of course, you know, um, pilots are always good demonstration pilots to uh, experiment to see uh, you know, what kind of outcomes we get with different modalities and innovations that we create. And we have some, I, I, like to, I like to invent some myself. So, and I may get to that today if I have time. Similarly, as I mentioned, there, are, there were concerns that earlier treatment and psychiatric systems of care would flood severely atrophied inpatient psychiatric infrastructure. There were some studies done that were written about by Robert D. Miller, MD, who's also a PhD, that showed North Carolina, Alaska, Kansas, Texas, and Colorado that past psychiatric deterioration criteria for commitment all experienced decreases in admissions. In states where rates of admission increased, studies showed that those increases were not necessarily a result of new criteria. People entering the system as a result of legal changes were not new people. They were the same people, but they were being caught earlier upstream. And that's in a study called Need for Treatment Criteria for Involuntary Civil Commitment in uh, JAM Psychiatry, uh, 19, uh, October 1st, 1992, Impacting Practice. I won't dwell on the history of civil commitment standards that with the growth of anti-psychiatry saw the recession from early treatment. As we all know, and hopefully acknowledge, the history of psychiatry is tainted. And as a result, psychiatry lost its most basic tool for early treatment of people living with severe mental illnesses, which is involuntary civil commitment. Dangerousness replaced severity of illness as the legal standard for imposing care on those whose disease often manifests with lack of insight into one's own mental illness. So this combination of need for treatment, anisognosia, and um, you know, lack, of, lack of access has been a deadly combination. And something that I see every day in my work, which I'll also talk about, where people end up with no choice but being forced into homelessness, uh, incarceration, and never ending, you know, uh, the never ending revolving doors of, of short term psychiatric, acute psychiatric hospitalization, which do nothing. Uh, to stabilize or to treat or to help a person with serious mental illness. And as a result, it just makes them more systems resistant, it makes it harder for us to reach them. And of course, then it comes along with substance use disorder and all of, all of those other things. So we're not, you know, we're not the system the way it exists now. So it's incredibly broken. It's an incredibly complex situation. But the people who are most suffering are the people who are most deserving of the help. So a judge that I once worked with said, if you need treatment for a serious mental illness, shoot a gun through your ceiling into your neighbor's apartment. The police will come and take you to the hospital. If you're not violent, you go under a bridge to die a slow and tortured death. EMS are constantly scraping people off the street and digging skeletons out of closets, literally. Nobody cares about people who aren't dangerous. But laws shouldn't require there to be a victim in order for, the, for a person to get treatment. So for those of you who like to read legis legislation, you can visit the psychiatric deterioration bill that we, got cost, or that we got passed on the Louisiana legislative website. 
You can look for House Bill 335 that was introduced in the 2022 regular session by Representative Royce Duplessis. And the website is legis, L-G-I-S, like legislature, L-G-I-S dot L-A dot gov. You can just email me and I'll send it to you. And my email, um, which will be, I'm sure, it's, I think it's already posted um, in the biographies, but I'll give it to you again. It's healingminds, M-I-N-D-S, NOLA at gmail.com. So rather than a fourth criteria for civil commitment, we amended the grave disability statute instead to include psychiatric deterioration and included a definition. Here's how our grave disability statute now reads. Gravely disabled means the condition of a person who is unable to provide for his own basic physical needs, such as essential food, clothing, medical care, and or shelter. As a result of serious mental illness, or a substance related or addictive disorder and is unable to survive safely in freedom or protect himself from serious physical harm or significant psychiatric deterioration. That those are the words we added, serious physical harm or significant psychiatric deterioration. The term also includes incapacitation by alcohol, which means the condition of a person who as a result of the alcohol is unconscious or whose judgment is otherwise so impaired, he is incapable of realizing and making a rational decision with respect to his need for treatment. The definition is psychiatric deterioration means a decline in mental functioning, which diminishes the person's capacity to reason or exercise judgment. So how is this implemented into various laws or that Title 28 is our mental health or mental health law. So how, how does that actually look, right? Um, now we're just beginning to implement this change. So um, it's still a work in progress, but there are various areas where this would impact a person's decision, a doctor's decision as to whether or not the person meets criteria for an involuntary commitment. So that can happen, um, well, in the hospitals uh, with the it, what's called a phys physician's evaluation certificate. Um, that's like a 5150 in California and, you know, various other definitions across the state. But a, a, a PEC, which physician's evaluation certificate, is the, um, is the decision by the doctor that allows a person to be admitted to, to uh, involuntary psychiatric care for up to 15 days. Um, now that can be extended, of course, with the judicial commitment, but typically that's how it goes. Uh, now there's also a coroner's evaluation certificate. So I have to talk about, we can't talk about Louisiana without talking about our coroners. Why? Because Louisiana is the only state in the country and there's good and bad reasons for coroners who are able to issue, issue what are called orders of protective custody that allow law enforcement 72 hours to find an individual who meets criteria for involuntary civil commitment or civil commitment um, who and then transport that individual to a hospital. So an OPC always results in a hospital stay unless I suppose the person committed a crime, a serious crime on the scene or there was a warrant out for their arrest, in which case they may be taken to the jail. But police, for the most part, transport, and this is not just for coroner's commitments, this is also for 911 calls, 70% of people to hospitals. Um, about 1% or less go to jail and the rest are resolved on site. Now, this is for a serious mental illness crisis call. This is not for another situation with a person who has mental illness, but it's not a serious mental illness crisis call. Crisis calls police do take to hospitals. I have to say and give credit to our police consent decree, which in 2015 completely reformed the New Orleans Health Department, which had been a horrible, uh, one of the nation's worst police departments uh, historically up until that time. But in 2015, our, our, I, I just have to digress here for a minute, was, uh, uh, so our consent decree was implemented and uh, crisis intervention team training became a part of that um, decree of the judgment. Uh, so we adopted the Memphis model, best practices, you know, standard of CIT. And, and really, uh, I have to give credit to our police department for up till now have done 
really stellar work um, to uh, humanely and calmly and um, kindly uh, assist people in serious mental health crisis to go to hospitals. Um, now, what, what, why OPC? So why coroners? I mean, in Louisiana, I think what's good about that is that, and coroners, and the reason we use coroners is because it's, it's always the place people go, families can go for support, for bereavement services, for, you know, um, that's the coroners, I mean, obviously, because they care for the, the deceased. Um, is that is that um, point where community revolve, you know, community comes together, families come together, and they revol revolve around this this situation. Um, and so coroners have, you know, family counseling. They they do all of that, and so it seemed like it was kind of the natural place for people to go for help for to get help for someone with a loved or a loved one with a serious mental illness. Uh, coroners also um, had their own ambulances. I mean, our charity hospital had their own ambulances for a time. They don't do that anymore. Uh, that was, it was a non-police response to getting people into hospitals. So that remains, that's sort of enshrined in our laws that coroners are, are able to write these orders of protective custody. Um, now they can also, um, they can also do a, a, a physician evaluation certificate. The results in that long, or in the longer term civil commitment, it's still acute, but it's 15 days. That's called a coroner's evaluation certificate. Now coroners, a lot of them in Louisiana have very professional and seasoned psychiatrists that work um, in their offices. And so the coroners often aren't doing these evaluations themselves. They're sending their psychiatrist to the hospital to evaluate the, the patient. If the patient meets criteria, then the hospital can keep them for, you know, uh, until their insurance <laughs> expires. I don't think I have time to talk about that. So now there's also um, AOT. So I think, I think many, many of you are probably familiar with assisted outpatient treatment is a civil. It's a civil law um, that allows for a judge to order a person who has a history of treatment non-adherence resulting in repeated hospitalizations, maybe homelessness, maybe jail, um, to follow their treatment plan. They, they can, the judge can mandate that they adhere to treatment. Now, as part of the deal, the, the court also has to ensure that the person has support and services provided to them in order to be successful. Because in the eyes of the law, the law believes that it's not fair, and I agree with the law, to require a person to adhere to treatment if there are no services in order for them to be successful. That would be punitive, and we're not a punitive court. It's a, it's, it's a um, therapeutic court. We're a problem-solving court. We're a collaborative. We are a specialty court like mental health court. Only most specialty courts like mental health court require the commission of a crime in order for a person to benefit from the opportunity to participate in those programs. Civil um, AOT, assisted outpatient treatment, does not require the commission of a crime. We've also amended our law to make it family friend friendly so that families, uh, it's easier for families to be able to petition for someone who meets criteria to participate in our program. And I won't get into the nuts and bolts of the AOT law in this, uh, in this talk, um, but if you're interested, I'd be happy to explain how we do it here. The benefit of psychiatric deterioration or the new standard is that in the AOT program, if somebody's not compliant, then the court, we don't put people in jail, but the court is able to, if the person is showing deterioration, the provider, the, the judge can authorize the provider, the treatment provider to get the person back into the hospital for evaluation that starts that whole process of do they meet criteria for that the three days, that 72 hours, do they meet criteria for uh, a PEC, um, you know, longer stay, and an admit, an admit to a bed, step them up into a bed, right? Um, so now, because of the criteria, the old criteria, in our court, we really weren't able to authorize providers to get people into the hospital unless they met the inpatient criteria of dangerousness to self, others, or grave disability. Meaning that if they're not compliant in the assisted outpatient treatment program, they might've been doing well, 
but they have to fall all the way down to the bottom of the cliff again before we can get them back into, loop them back into treatment and then loop them back into our program. So, and we know that every time someone falls to the bottom of the cliff, it's harder to climb to the top again. Um, it's harder for all of us. Just uh, you think about anything that you've done, maybe quit smoking or, you know, you have an addiction or, or you know, maybe a bad habit that you've had to deal with, or maybe it was something else where you had to work really, really hard to get, you know, the benefits of uh, the, the, the project. Um, if all falls to pieces and you have to do it again, nobody wants to do something that was that hard over again, knowing how hard it was. But when you don't know how hard it is, you're willing to do that journey because you don't know, you know, you haven't done it before. So you keep going, right? But when you look back, you're like, do I really want to do that again? So the more people fail, the harder it is for them to recover. And also there is a physical deterioration, the psychiatric deterioration. We do know that repeated psychiatric or psychotic breaks can do significant material damage to the brain, right? The organ that of course we all need to make good decisions for ourselves. Um, there's lots of research on that. So this law now, what it does is if our, in our AOT program, if a person is not compliant, we can circle them back in right away as soon as they start to show signs of deterioration. So that's a real benefit. Um, and most of the families that I work with are uh, the, 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 you know, and most of our clients actually are family uh, referrals. Um, and they, they do go through the coroner's offices. So, so that's good. And I'm glad now that the coroners are actually looking at implementing this new standard so that a family member doesn't have to wait for violence before they go to the coroner to say, I need an order of protective custody. Now the family member can go to the coroner and say, my loved one, histor this is their history. His look at them in full context. Historically, you know, this is how they were when they were medicated. This is what happened when they went off their medication. And this, these are the, this is, these are, these are their behaviors since they went off their medication that if we don't step in, they're for sure falling off the cliff again, because family members know. We say that, you know, behavior is not predictable, but it is actually. And we know that through, you know, we, we see that historically when people, um, you know, especially in families, when they're not taking their medications, they go through these cycles, same things happen over and over and over again. So to a certain extent, behavior is predictable. And so we will, we, we like to intervene at the earliest stage, not later, which is why I called my presentation harm mitigation approach. It's earlier intervention. It doesn't solve all the problems, uh, you know, that, that uh, of, of the lack of, you know, full continuum of coordinated psychiatric treatment and care that we need. We absolutely need those things. Um, when I was testifying at the Senate in favor of the bill, there was one person there in opposition that said, no, but the hospitals are terrible and there are all these problems. And I agreed with absolutely everything she said. But is that a reason to deny the person the opportunity to access treatment when they need it? I just don't think it is. So I'll conclude there. Um, I just want to say, I think I'm at half an hour. If I'm <laughs> cut me off, Jason, if I'm going on too long. But at times, advocacy is exhausting and discouraging. But looking back, I see the progress that we've made. We have a long way to go. But what keeps me going is knowing that there are people right now with serious brain disorders who will spend a lifetime in prison, unmedicated, and kept mentally kept mentally incompetent just to avoid execution. And the fact that they got there because our mental health laws said that they had to be dangerous is why I keep fighting. If there were ever, if there were ever a definition for torture, I'm sure that is it. And every time I tell somebody what I do, the response is almost always that they have a family member or know someone who is struggling with untreated or undertreated serious mental illness. And there are many people who walk among us every day who are waiting to tell their story. I want to say to people watching, reach out to them, educate them, talk to them. It's not always about the numbers and the data. That's important. I support that. But sometimes it's just about the heart and the compassion. So um, I'll end there. I could go on for hours. I have so many clients I'd love to talk about, 
um, so many heartbreaking stories and why we need this standard. Um, it's a start. It's a step in the right direction. So thank you, Jason. Thank you, everybody, um, for having me. And really excited to hear everybody else.